Very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited to welcome you all to the webinar series held in English for the year 2023, organized by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka with the Seminars Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Today's topic for the day is Interim Relief and Injunctions in Civil Matters. This webinar series is conducted on the Zoom platform, and those who are, have been unable to join and register us on the Zoom could also join by watching the live stream on the BSL YouTube channel. Before we start the proceedings, I would like to thank the Seminars Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, headed by Mr. Isuru Balapatabandi, Secretary of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, for his immense work behind this series. And also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Mr. Kaushalya Navaratna, Attorney at Law, and the Management Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for all the support and the guidance given to us in organizing this webinar series. Today's topic is interim relief and the and injunctions in civil matters. And joining us today. I believe uh, there is a small technical difficulty. Uh, joining us today uh, are two eminent presidents' council, Mr. Chandagajaya Sundara and Mr. Faiza Mustafa. Uh, thank you, Nikini. Uh, are you back, Nikini? Sorry about the inconvenience. I think uh, uh, my signal was dropped. Uh, Tarika, can you hear me? Yes, you're clear. Sarang, I think we will, we now can share the profiles of the distinguished panelists, uh, starting from Mr. Mustafa, Faiz Mustafa, President's Council, and his profile now will be shared on the screen. Secondly, we have here with us today Mr. Chandaka Jasundara, President's Council, and you'll be able to see his profile now on the screen. Finally, we, I would like to introduce our moderator for the today's session, Mr. Tarika Nanayakara, Attorney at Law and you will be able to see his profile on the screen now. Thank you. So without further ado, we would like to start the proceedings of the, uh, today and start our discussion on this important subject or important topic rather on interim relief and injunctions. And now to start the proceedings, I would like to hand over the proceedings to Mr. Tarek Nanayakar at Atla. Over to you, Mr. Tarnanakar. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nikini Mapadigama. Good evening, everybody. Uh, and good uh, evening. Mr. Nanakar, I think you're on mute. Uh, I think I'm correct. We can hear you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2023 webinar series, uh, of which the topic today is uh, interim uh, relief and injunctions in civil matters. Uh, joining with us are two eminent presidents council, Mr. Faiza Mustafa and Mr. Sandhag Jayasundara, both uh, having extensive experience and expertise on uh, injunctions, among other things. And uh, before we start uh, our session, I would like to uh, mention that we have altered the format, format a little and that the two eminent presidents council would be uh, 
uh, responding to uh, certain questions that are raised by me in, in uh, place of a prepared presentation. And uh, then finally, the last half an hour will be open to the participants to raise any queries uh, from the uh, panelists. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the president of the Bar Association, Mr. Kaushalena Ratna, uh, secretary of the Bar Association, and the chairman of the seminars committee, Mr. Surubala Patabandi, also the convener of the uh, deputy chairman of the seminars committee, Mr. Pandula Vanyarachi, and the conveners of the committee, uh, Ms. Nikini Mapitigama, Mr. Sampath Pereira, and Ms. Deshini Bandara, and also the assistant conveners, uh, Ms. Adisha Disanayaka and Ms. Dilhara Jayasekar. Thank you very much for all the hard work put in uh, to further the continuing education of the legal profession. And having said that, I would like to uh, proceed uh, with the session now. Uh, my first question would be to Mr. Chandaka Jayasundara, President's Council. Uh, sir, uh, now injunctions is a very specific relief. And uh, when a client comes to you with a matter, say a continuing act or nuisance that is detrimental to that client, uh, you would advise on what instances would you advise a client to go for injunctive relief as in uh, you you may take uh, a start from the uh, from section 54 of the judicature act and in what situations would be an injunction most suitable uh, to prevent uh, harm continuing harm done to a client so you would need to unmute Thanks. thank you Tarak, and thank you the my association for inviting me. Uh, so if a client comes to you with a problem which you believe uh, needs some interim protection or an interim measure of protection, the first thing you must, uh, I suppose, uh, find out is what is the, uh, the law that relates to the underlying uh, dispute between the parties. Because in interim injunctions, enjoining orders, and interim orders are available under different uh, statutes and different principles. So, but they all uh, emanate from uh, section of the, the principles set out in section 54 of the Judicature Act. That is any threat or uh, harm or infringement uh, that is causing damage to the plaintiff. Uh, so, interim relief is available in different areas. If we take the general law, uh, and especially if you are looking at commercial law in general, the most common uh, interim relief that is obtained is, of course, uh, parat executions against banks. Uh, then you also have the other interim measures or enjoining orders that are available in respect of contractual disputes that have arisen between the parties. These may differ, but generally on contractual disputes. Then you would also have in the general scheme of things, uh, injunctions, which is becoming quite common because of the prevalence of uh, social media and the very active media in Sri Lanka, uh, interim relief that is can be obtained in uh, uh, in matters of defamation, uh, whether protection can be obtained uh, uh, and uh, the any defamatory statements could be uh, restrained. Of course, I don't have much experience or knowledge. It is also available in respect of uh, property law and uh, family law, especially divorce proceedings. Then. Uh, specifically, uh, uh, in, in a more special kinds of jurisdiction, interim measures of protection are available where uh, there is a contractual dispute where the parties have agreed for a uh, uh, for the disputes to be resolved by arbitration. So, uh, do we wait until the tribunal is set up and ask for the interim measures of protection uh, that can be obtained from the tribunal in terms of the Arbitration Act? or 
to the uh, seek the court's protection and a court order pending the decision of the arbitral tribunal on any application for interim measures. Uh, the Intellectual Property Act also provides uh, the right to seek injunctive relief in terms of Section 172 uh, of the Intellectual Property Act uh, for any infringement of any matter that is uh, dealt with in the Intellectual Property Act, including copyright, pat patents, uh, trademarks, unfair competition, so on and so forth. Then there is also the special jurisdiction for interim relief that is available under the Companies Act, which uh, in Section 521 and Section 233 provides the uh, entitlement to seek interim relief. So the first thing is to figure out what is the underlying law in which you are going to go into court. The second then thereafter is what is the court that you need to go. Uh, and of course, the third uh, important matter is the time period, uh, especially because in all these uh, reliefs, uh, what is of most importance is that there is no lashes or delay in proceeding because uh, in most cases, lashes have been the, uh, the insurmountable barrier in obtaining interim relief. Then the other most important thing as a counsel or an attorney going into court is again one of the basic, because most of the interim relief is obtained ex parte, the duty of the party going into court and seeking ex parte relief of full and complete disclosure and uh, and uh, not be guilty of misrepresentation or suppression. So it is imperative that whether it is what the, the information, whether you go to court with or not is your role, your, your job. Uh, but it is imperative that you ask your client for a full and complete disclosure uh, because other than lashes, one of the main uh, reasons for interim relief or injunctions or enjoining are to be mostly vacated is on the basis of suppression and misrepresentation. So those are the initial matters that you need to look at. And also, especially in the Western province, it is imperative that you figure out whether you need to go to the commercial court, whether you need to go to the district court and uh, or any other forum. Those are the factors, Taraka, that you will have to look at and advise a plan. Thank you very much, uh, sir, Mr. Tandagajar Sundara. And my next question would be to Mr. Faisal Mustafa, President's Council. Sir, now uh, it is well settled since the celebrated case of Felix Das Bandar Nayaka versus the State Film Corporation 1981 to SLR, uh, the test for injunctions. Uh, would you? be so kind as to educate us on uh, the three tier test laid down in uh, the Felix Dash Bandarnaika's case uh, for the granting of an injunction or enjoining order. Thank you, sir. Firstly, to get injunctive relief, we must have a prima facie case. The next court is going to see whether there is a reasonable probability of winning a case. That is for court to adjudicate. We have to establish a case that means in the face of it, court should be satisfied that there is a matter to be looked into and there is a great possibility of you winning the case. The second issue is the balance of convenience. The balance of convenience would be would greater damage be caused to the plaintiff or to the defender. That is, if you don't go into court, you will suffer damage more than the damage which would, would be caused to the defendant. And that is the test which court would adopt. And also, since it's an equitable re uh, relief, court will look into see whether there is a full disclosure. Unfortunately, when sometimes when you go to a lawyer, they seem to pick and select documents. That is a great mistake because not only the credibility of the client, the credibility of the counsel matters. So if you go to court, you should go to court with a full disclosure and tell your client to give all the documents because you can't plead in that burden. Even if you have the best of cases, if you have suppressed or misrepresented facts, 
that would prejudice your case in a great manner. Sometimes there might be a document which you feel is against you. So you plead the document, but you can give a, a different interpretation to the document. But unless there's a full and fair disclosure, even if you have the best of cases, the other side comes to court and say, you have suppressed or misrepresented material facts. And after the walk and such case, you can't plead inadvertence. And it should be a material suppression. That means the generally the lawyer on the other side would always argue that is a material suppression, saying that if this document was placed before court, court would not have issued the enjoining order. And, and, and on those grounds, court would not issue the interim relief. So those are the basic principles should be followed by, by a counsel when a client comes with regard to injunctive relief. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, my next question would be to Mr. Jayasundara. Uh, sir, now when an enjoining order, sorry. Uh, sir, when an enjoining order is issued, it is issued ex parte. And uh, then the notices uh, are served and a party who is affected by that particular enjoining order would invariably want to have it set aside. What are the options available, sir, under the Civil Procedure Code? We know that injunctions are granted in terms of Section 662. And what are the options? Because we know there is Section 664, Subsection 3, as well as Section 666 of the Civil Procedure Code, both uh, setting out opportunities to uh, for a party to uh, plead to set, have an enjoining order set aside. Uh, which provision is appropriate at uh, which point of time, sir, would be my question. So I think Faiza is the one who is better suited to uh, answer this because uh, he's a past master at uh, getting enjoining orders set aside. So if you can, so if you can address on six. Yeah, I, I'll just, uh, if I can, uh, if I can, uh, I will just try and share uh, the relevant provisions. Okay, sorry, they have. Different. Okay, so basically, you're looking at Enjoining orders are issued in terms of section 664. Uh, just give me a second. Uh, let me just get the CPC off. Okay. So it's given under section 664 and enjoining orders are specifically given uh, where uh, the, uh, with, there would be uh, issues with regard to uh, the delay in granting an interim injunction would uh, prejudice the plaintiff. So that's 664. In those instances, the section 664 pro provides uh, a mechanism to obtaining enjoining orders pending the uh, determination of the interim application for interim injunction. So there are a uh, couple of ways of uh, getting the getting an enjoining order vacated. One is uh, and the other met other uh, sorry in in uh, seeking to set aside an interim enjoining order. Uh, the how you do it is mostly uh, dependent on whether you would give the opposing party, that is the plaintiff, also an opportunity to counter whatever that your procedure your uh, your uh, presenting to court uh, to set aside the enjoining order. That is one of the main factors in deciding which manner that you you would. Uh, consider uh, uh, seeking an order for uh, to vacate an enjoining order. So 6642 specifies that uh, uh, sorry, uh, in uh, section 6643 specifies that the court may of its own motion or an application made by a party suspend the operation of an enjoining order issued under subsection 2 if it is satisfied that such order was obtained by suppression or misrepresentation of uh, any material fact. Now, uh, that is the specific provision 
that is provided in the uh, civil procedure code to seek uh, suspension or a vacation of an enjoining order but that uh, that restricts the the uh, inquiry by the court to your application to whether there has been suppression or misrepresentation now suppression and misrepresentation you can you can fit it in to uh, for example if you have a jurisdictional objection whether that can, that can it will depend on whether you can fit that jurisdictional objection to suppression and misrepresentation if you go the way of uh, 6643 6642 specifies that the enjoining order will be for a period not exceeding 14 days in the first instance and the court may be may for good and sufficient reasons which shall be recorded extend for a period not exceeding 14 days now that is specially one if you don't want an opportunity to be given now this is practical advice right this is not like it's not written anywhere in, in any statute uh, if you don't want the plaintiff uh, strategically to uh, have another say in the matter uh, this would be the best opportunity where you go and inform court that there aren't good and sufficient reasons to extend it beyond the 14 days now there you can do that uh, orally without filing documentation but that will also depend specifically on whether you can challenge the enjoining order or seek the suspension uh, or the vacation of the enjoining order on the matters pleaded in the plaint itself exfaciate the plaint and in most cases where there are jurisdictional issues uh, where there are uh, where, where there are serious issues of suppression and misrepresentation or any serious matter which disentitles the plaintiff for an enjoining order lashes is another ground then you can ask the court not to extend the enjoining order uh, enjoining order now another aspect of 664 uh, 3 is that you will be basically going through the same facts and uh, facts and the law that you will be going in when you uh, make an when the interim injunction application inquiry is also taken. So you might have a situation that you might have to uh, argue the same point twice over, uh, or a situation where a court will say, "Why don't we take it up uh, with the interim injunction?" Then. Yes, also the provisions in section 666, whereby the uh, enjoining or interim injunction or an enjoining order can be discharged or varied uh, or set aside by the court or an application made uh, by any party dissatisfied. So that, that again is the statutory provision that is stipulated in 666, but it also because you have to make that application separately uh, and uh, in most instances, it has to be by way in writing that gives an opportunity to the plaintiff to counter what you are saying. So it's a strategic decision whether you need to uh, go under 6642, 3 or 666. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, especially if you can't pinpoint any suppression or misrepresentation, and also issues of urgency where most of the, the time the clients come like two, three days before the, uh, uh, the case is coming up for the extension of the enjoining order. Uh, so you might have time restrictions and time restrictions in making a written application to court. The most convenient, if you have the if you have the law and facts behind you is to a object to the extension of the enjoining order. Thank you, sir. And uh, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Mustafa this question. Sir, now, uh, when you... Uh, well, Tarak, can, can I just... Mr. Tarak, can I just add something to what Mr. Jasper yes. said? Yes. These provisions? yes. I think uh, when you make an application under 6642, you have to be very confident that you're objecting to on the plane. 
because as much as the plaintiff has to, for good and sufficient reason, move to extend the, the enjoining order, you have the right to object to it. But section 6643 is only a limited application for suppression and misrepresentation. So generally, if you feel you can't wait before the summons returnable day, you go and file the papers under 6643. But unfortunately, most judges would say file objections and then the process would go after the summons returnable day. So six section 6642 for good and sufficient reason would be a good mechanism. Then under section 666, it's wider in scope because otherwise you have to go by way of, if you 6643 application objecting for, on the grounds of suppression and misrepresentation, if you file a petition, section 666 is wider. But then again, unfortunately, even though the statute provides for it, since you have to file objections, if you file a plain, then you file your objections and court, court is adjudicated on the plain and the objection. But if you file papers under 6643 or under 6643, the plaintiff gets an opportunity of filing additional material. So a counsel, when you are de determining what steps should be taken, if you adhere to 6643 or 666, you're giving the plaintiff an opportunity of bringing in further pleadings. So if you can wait and, and there is no danger in waiting, filing objections for the interim injunction, would be would be a, a good good manner a good manner to proceed because you don't give the plaintiff another opportunity to file pleadings. Sir, I would uh, I would like to uh, raise another question building on what the point you brought. Now, for for a, as as we all know, there is no set procedure uh, dictated in the civil procedure code for the interim injunction inquiry, and it is through case law that and and cases curia the practice of court that. Uh, the procedure has been built upon so uh, if you as you say if if as you say it might be detrimental to a client to go by 6643 where there is no dire urgency because the plaintiff can uh, file objections with the leave of court and introduce new material but uh, i see particularly in the district court of Colombo where all all of us practice uh, we see that uh, the judges as well as the council are more inclined to expedite the interim injunction inquiry uh, where the defendant will file uh, objections to the interim injunction. Then, sir, my question to you is, is there a provision or is there uh, an opportunity for a plaintiff to move for count objections and or counter to do it? I think the best way of answering this question to go back to what the law was prior to 1988. Earlier, prior to 1988, the amendment was brought in 1988 to vacate the injunction, you have to go by way of summary procedure. So when, when, when you go by way of summary procedure, the party who obtained the injunction has a right to file papers. Subsequent to the amendment in 1988, it was under regular procedure and the civil procedure is silent whether you could file a counter affidavit or not. But practically looking, looking at it, you file a plaint. The defendant introduces new material which is blatantly false. So therefore, unless you counter that, grave prejudice would be caused. But you also get the objection taken by the defendant that you are breaching the principles of Uberima Fide by filing a counter affidavit. But the judge gets an opportunity when he adjudicates the interim injunction, whether he's adducing, uh, uh, countering material placed by the defendant or he's adducing new material. So I think a, a counter affidavit is necessary where the plaintiff brings in, where the defendant brings in new material and with, and I, and, the, and the plaintiff with the leave of court should be able to do so. Recently, I argued a matter in the civil appellate court where court said, based on the circumstances, if the defendant has adduced new material which the plaintiff was unaware of and which is required to be countered, he should be entitled to file a counter affidavit. And also, basic law, the basic law is what has not been prevented is permissible. So there is no bar to file a counter affidavit. So my in my opinion, 
there is legal entitlement to file a counter affidavit, though there is no specific provision to do so. So, uh, Taraka, can I just add uh, yes, something to that? Because <clears throat> the uh, when this amendment came in 1988, uh, the at the initial stage stages in this concept of the enjoining order and setting aside uh, in 664 came in 1988. The huh. practice was to file a claim and file a separate petition for. Uh, in the, for the enjoining order and the interim injunction, and it is the that separate petition that you used to go for the interim injunction inquiry. It is subsequently and more practice of course, or the cursus curiae that now you ask for that, and that is available in the uh, in the judicature act. You ask for the enjoining order also in the plain. So uh, I also believe that counter objections. Uh, should be permitted, but it should be permitted on very, very limited, strict, uh, strict uh, criteria because the prevalent or the or the principle is that the plaintiff must uh, by sink or swim on the matters pleaded in the plain. So when the defendant comes with his side of the story, you can't ask the plaintiff again to uh, like to give more support by expanding on what he should have told court at the point of going in and getting the adjoining order. However, it is, I think, Paiso also agrees that if the defendant brings in matters which are not either germane to the, uh, uh, the application before court or brings in matters which are not strictly within the four corners of the plaintiff's case for an in, in, enjoining order or interim injunction, then only on that on very, very strict, limited circumstances, count objections could be permitted. And then there's another issue. The issue is you'll have an inquiry within the inquiry. Now you file a plane. The defendant files his objections to court to adjudicate at that point of time, whether it's new month, all that should be decided at the interim injunction inquiry. I, I think. The fi filing of a counter affidavit should be as of right, but at the interim injunction inquiry, the judge should adjudicate whether he has supplemented material or or, or whatever. Because otherwise, the, the, the whole procedure there will be always that that argument will go on for some time. Yeah. So this is also we I remember a couple of weeks ago last week we had the discussion about this entire thing about the proper procedure not stipulated in the civil procedure code with regard, especially with regard to the vacation of interim orders. Now, uh, the Companies Act in Section 521 uh, specifically provides how to set aside an interim order that, that has been obtained. Now, that sort of specific provision in the, uh, in the uh, civil procedure with regard to enjoining orders is not specified. Now, and then what is the point of this enjoining order where you keep on extending it by every two weeks uh, like by road uh, if there is no big immediate issue with it. Uh, maybe the civil procedure or the drafter should see whether we should uh, uh, maybe take something from the uh, provisions of the companies that in respect of interim orders, which is much more conducive. We have found in, in, in the commercial high court that the interim orders, they are there is a specific procedure. We know what we have to do. We know how to get the set it aside, uh, which, which is not specifically provided. And we are looking at every time it's a uh, it's trial and error and how the judge thinks. But Chandra, there's another issue. It's one minute, Chandra, there's another issue now. 521, you, you can't object on the papers file. That is, I think that's a that allows them allows a party who gets an interim order to keep it pending for a month. And by that time, the uh, the damage would have been suffered. So yeah. as a, that's another issue. Recently, I went to court. They didn't have the 5% threshold. And the judge made an order to file papers and come. So I think if you can go in a FR, you can object to the interim order on the pleadings. In a rigid, in a writ application, you can. In an injunction, you can. Here, yeah, because of these 521 provisions, Judges feel that you can't object to even on a jurisdictional object without filing ple pleadings. But time because, is of essence of every order. Yeah, because 521 says any application has to be by way of petition and affidavit. 
So that so question is whether you can object to on the pleadings. I think is a big issue which court has to look into. Thank you, sir. Very interesting uh, point, and thank you for the contribution uh, by both of you all. I think uh, we have made that point clear. But however, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, sir, Mr. Mustafa, uh, sir. Now, Section six six four two of the Civil Procedure Code provides that an enjoining order should be extended for good and sufficient reason. And uh, on that basis, you go as you uh, uh, elaborated upon earlier. On that basis, on the 14th day when the matter comes up for extension, you go and object. Uh, at that particular point, can you object without filing any papers? And do you need to give notice to the other party by way of a motion that your uh, 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 that you're objecting under 66642, or can you just on the uh, on the first uh, first day? Uh, for extension, that is the 14 days since the granting of the enjoining order. Can you just go and object, sir? You can because it says it stays for good and sufficient reason. The plaintiff can move to extend the enjoining order. That, that gives you the right for good and sufficient reason to establish to court. Then the enjoining order should not be extended. But it's a difficult task because there is an affidavit. You have no material, but but always if you go through the pleadings. On the pleadings, if there is contradiction, if there is a jurisdictional objection, you can take up that objection. So on the 14th day, it's a right, it's a statutory right you have to object on the plane, saying that this plane did not warrant the issue of an enjoining order. Therefore, I state that this enjoining order should not be extended. Thank you, sir. My next question would be to Mr. Chandakaja Sundara. Sir, now that uh, we have covered a considerable uh, uh, section of the district court matters particularly, I would like to uh, move on to uh, the Companies Act, interim orders under the Companies Act. So under Section 521, you're entitled, either party is, I believe, entitled to uh, apply for interim relief. Uh, what qualifies in, in terms of the injunctions you educated us, what qualifies uh, for for an injunction or an injunction order? And in the, under the Companies Act, what are the aspects covered by these interim orders? On what yeah. locations can you obtain? Yeah. So the basic principles remain the same. Uh, the basic principles remain the same. That is the underlying application for interim relief under 521 uh, is generally considered uh, the same principles that are applicable to interim injunction, that is a uh, prima facie case, suppression, misrepresentation, balance of contentions, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, there is, uh, in what 521 says is this, and just keep on the contradict this question, right? Uh, it says, uh, Pending the making of a final order in any application or reference to court made under this act. So the first thing you have to uh, address your mind to is uh, whether your substantive application, your final relief that you're obtaining, you're seeking to obtain in a company dispute uh, is uh, or arises out of a uh, provision that is made under the Companies Act. Now, the Companies Act, there is a finite amount of grounds on which you can go to court. Uh, I think it's, I think it's about in only about 20, between 25 to 30 specific sections stipulate uh, or gives or entitles a party to invoke the provisions of the Companies Act to go into court. So, your first consideration should be whether your action or sorry your application your final substantive application uh, is an invocation of the uh, provisions of the companies act because there are common law remedies in company law that are not provided in the uh, in the uh, the uh, companies act so especially with regard to uh, direct disputes uh, or disputes between the directors, uh, where those directors are not shareholders, where shareholders cannot 
uh, come within the criteria, uh, applicable criteria to make an application for oppression and mismanagement, there are common law remedies where you uh, can go into court arising out of a com- out of a company dispute. Not every company dispute gives you a right to invoke the provisions of the Companies Act. There's a finite finite amount of relief that you can uh, uh, obtain under the Companies Act. So the first thing, as I said earlier, that we should consider is whether your final relief is a relief uh, relief or an application or a reference to court made under the Companies Act. If it is not under the Companies Act, then you have to go to the general law of uh, uh, sorry of uh, seeking in, uh, an enjoining order and an interim injunction. Then the next one is there. Obviously, there has to be an application uh, by the party. So they are either the plaintiff or the respondents can make this application subsequently as it is provided. Then make such interim order, including a restraining order, as in the sphere. Now they are. Uh, uh, and also it says uh, that it can be made uh, ex parte or after notice to the respondent. Then, uh, so the second criteria you need to, uh, and you need to satisfy is the general principles of law in respect of interim relief, seeking interim relief, and also the general principles of law in going into court and seeking ex parte orders, especially to go uh, with clean hands, lashes, all those uh, principles that are applicable to obtaining interim relief has to be satisfied uh, under the provisions of the Companies Act also. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to uh, go back to a matter Mr. Mustafa raised earlier. This question is to Mr. Mustafa. (laughs) Sir, as you pointed out earlier that when an interim order is granted under Section 521, there's a significant amount of prejudice caused to the respondent in that particular case because uh, with you can't object to an interim order without uh, filing papers. Uh, what would you think? What would what would be the most expeditious way in terms of the current legal regime to fight an interim order if you're for a respondent? I believe we are entitled to do so by way of motion and bring it to the notice of court. And I also believe it's a jurisdictional objection. Now, recently I had a case where the threshold on the face of it was not met. But court had granted interim relief. But I think in terms of the Companies Act, other than restraining orders, because there's a wider ambit, and the prejudice of parties, I mean, if I was advising a client, sometimes if I get the interim order, that would suffice for me to take control of a company. I had a case recently where by way of interim orders, the minor majority has become the minority and the minority had become the majority. Mr. Jatul, both of us did that case. So if that interim order continued for some time, but luckily they did not do that, but otherwise they could have thrown all the directors out of the company and taken control. So it's a very dangerous situation because an order, interim order obtained and under the Companies Act at present would take a month, a month and a half to get it vacated. So I believe that court should entertain even without filing papers because there's basic norm. Even I believe that section should be interpreted to, to give effect that if you are not going to object other than in terms of the petition, because if you are taking a jurisdiction objection, and you can establish that the principles of Uberima Fida has been violated when the petitioner has obtained the relief, that court should give an opportunity for a party to vacate it on the face of the petition. And 521 should not be construed to saying that on a, to say that any grounds you have to file papers and come because if you file papers, the interim order would be in operation for some time. So my advice, even though I went to court and recently and took up a jurisdictional objection, court held that I should file papers. I think I, I think that the the I think that one has a right to come to court under 521 if if there's a blatant violation of the principles of Barima Fide or, or jurisdiction jurisdiction because in, the, in a company's action, uh, in a uh, in an oppression mismanagement action, you can get an interim order preventing the directors from functioning. 
and you get that order and you can take control of the company. I think Mr. Jasundar also will end like lost because 5 to 1, if you are not entitled to, ob to object on the petition and if you go to the process of an inquiry, it will take a good month and a month and a half. And if one party has got an order preventing the directors from functioning, one could make use of the interim order to take control of the company and create havoc in the company. I think Mr. Jas Jasundara's uh, insight all, uh, into this also will be very useful. Uh, thank you, sir. Mr. Jasundara, what is, would be your opinion on the same uh, question? So, uh, so for, uh, at least luckily, the uh, Supervision High Court is aware of this and there are quite frequently applications to vacate and set aside almost on a daily basis, especially with uh, lawyers having very tight schedules. Now, uh, I'm in the middle of something where we are sitting every day from almost every day uh, from 9 to about 10 before the regular work starts. Uh, there are about four counsel who are in that case. So for the la last couple of weeks, I mean, I think almost over five days, uh, we have been having extensive uh, an extensive inquiry into the interim order. Uh, in fact, even tomorrow it's starting at nine o'clock. Uh, so the court is aware of this issue. Now the problem, as I see, is uh, is in section in section five hundred and twenty, which says. Uh, every application or reference to court under the provisions of this Act shall, unless otherwise expressly provided, or unless the court otherwise directs me by way of petition and affidavit. So I would think that we make use of the second limb of that, uh, that is, unless the court otherwise directs and argue that, especially in cases of jurisdiction, of course, the courts have generally uh, are of the view that we need to file papers, but I think there is sufficient provisions in 520 to seek the court's permission because the damage uh, will be uh, will, uh, will be so prejudicial to the respondent. And as uh, Pfizer and uh, all of us who work to do company cases know, in company cases, the guy who or the party who goes first into court gets a definite advantage because you can like uh, you you have a if you, if you are the first to go into court you have a definite advantage strategically so in those instances i think the court should be uh, uh, liberal to the extent of not insisting because that provision is there in section 520 not to insist on uh, pleadings but again like the, uh, the object in the extension of the enjoining order, you have to uh, do that on what is set out in the petition or petition itself. You have to break the case on that. You can't say on other some other information or documentation you need it set aside. It has to be on its face the claim the, or the petition. The petition cannot continue. If that is so, and if the prejudice that is that will be caused is so much and so prejudicial, then I think you have a right to ask that you be permitted to seek the uh, the revocation of an interim order without filing pleadings. Thank you, sir. I I believe uh, both your answers taken together have cl uh, clarified that position. Uh, now, I would like to uh, ask you, uh, sir, Mr. Jayasundara, another question on entry orders under the Companies Act. Uh, Section 233, Section 233 uh, of the Companies Act also provides for restraining orders. What is the scope and uh, the difference between an uh, entry order under Section 521 and a restraining order under Section 233, subsection? So, uh, 233 is a much more restrictive uh, manner or uh, way of obtaining interim relief and also uh, is further restricted by the fact that you can seek interim relief only in respect of uh, future infringements or future, uh, future uh, violations of either the articles or the company. Uh, provisions of the company set. So the main uh, difference between an application under uh, uh, 521 and also the, uh, I will come to that uh, second part later, but so 233 specifically will be 
that restraining order uh, again the people who can go into the court is restricted then it has to be uh, to restrain an act uh, or conduct that would contravene the uh, uh, contravene the articles of the company or the provisions of the act and uh, subsection 4 of 233 specifically says that the uh, uh, an order may not be made under this section in relation to conduct or course of conduct that has been completed so it has to be uh, an order that restrains future conduct uh, and but this has been argued uh, but i don't think there is any uh, decided jurisprudence in the supreme court as to whether a continuing uh, infringement or a in, uh, continuing wrongful conduct which which emanates from an act or conduct that has already completed for example let's say a board meeting or a board decision or a or a amendment to the articles of association uh, or a transfer of shares uh, which has been completed if that complete although the act itself which uh, which results in the damage uh, or prejudice has already been completed but the effect of that decision continues and it becomes a continuing violation of the articles or the provisions of the companies that with the section 233 uh, can be applied that, that has that that has been taken up and argued in the commission high court and 100% uh, sure of any decisions of the supreme court on this then the other factor is that uh, applications on the 233 uh, it is argued that you are obtaining your final relief before you even uh, uh, especially ex parte you are obtaining the final relief because it's a stand alone provision and specifically it says that sec subsection 6 says that the provisions of section 521 Uh, will not apply to interim orders made under this section so does that mean uh, 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 that uh, that uh, that the the respondents are then stuck till the end of the case because if you take 521 521 is the interim relief whereas the final relief is something completely different not some connected but it's a final relief but here you are seeking a restraining order as the final relief uh, which is in effect the final relief you are section subsection 5 gives the respondent a right to vacate uh, or revoke or vary the interim uh, the restraining order but it would seem that it is and it has been argued that section 233 has some uh, issues with regard to, and as we know you can't get the final relief in the in a by way of a preliminary interim order so that issue is there in 233 it's not used very frequently uh, but it's a very good weapon if you satisfy the criteria set out in set out in the section thank you sir uh, i would now go back to mr faizal mustafa uh, sir in a in injunctions in general the old school of thought is that where the damage can be quantified uh, injunction would not lie that is the old school of thought Uh, that is why i believe we have to plead irreparable grave and irreparable loss and damage uh, caused by the defendant's actions in the plaint itself and that is why the learned judges always insist upon that pleading however sir uh, mod- uh, the mod- the recent uh, developments uh, in jurisprudence uh, shows us that even if the loss can be quantified uh, and an injunction would lie what is your take on this what are your thoughts so i think the world also has been more progressive and originally the norm was if damages can be quantified then you can't get injunctive relief for example if you take a rent and ejectment case you enter into a lease agreement the le- the lease has expired and he is in possession and you also it's very clearly established that 
he wouldn't have the means to pay the damages. However, court has in those, in, especially with regard to rent and ejectment, court in Silavati Mala versus case. Now I think court has moved to the wrongdoer principle. From the point of quantifying damages being the basis on which injunctions are refused, court has moved forward. Even if damages can be quantified, if ex facie you can establish that the defendant is a wrongdoer and that he is violating the law and taking a benefit of his wrongful action. In Silavati Malava's case, that court should not be a party to that and therefore court should prevent that. And also court has been even more progressive in the shell gas case where uh, the, the sub final substantive relief there, the defendant had equipment of the plaintiff. They got an enjoining order preventing the defendant from uh, taking those equipment from that premises. So the earlier, but unfortunately, some of our judges also have a very conservative approach on the basis. They look at a plate and say, this damage can be quantified not knowing whether the defendant firstly can pay the damages and secondly, on the face of it, if there is a violation, that the wrongdoer should not be entitled to benefit from his wrongful act. So I say that today, courts have taken a more progressive approach. Most judges have, but some, judge, some judges haven't. But it is vital that courts also look at it from the wrongdoer principle because I, in my view, this... Quantifying damage is a very archaic principle because everything can be quantified today. Thank you, sir. And for the benefit of our viewers, I would like to give the references of the uh, two cases Mr. Mustafa quoted. Silvati Malava was Miliki Ratna, 1982, 1 SLR at page 384. And the Shell Gas case, Shell Gas versus Samyang Lanka Private Limited, 2005, 3 SLR at page 14. Uh, uh, so, like sorry, to, can I just? Uh, I, I'm, I'm coming to you. So, uh, I would like okay. to ask uh, about your take on the decision of Silavati Mallava versus yeah. Miliki. So, I don't 100% uh, agree with Pfizer with regard to Silavati Mallava. I think it's being abused. Uh, the the principle that was actually uh, uh, proposed or or in a, or. or which is the dicta of Silivati uh, Mallava. I have a, I have a personal view that it has been, uh, uh, it's, it's been abused now, and uh, Faiza and I are in the Supreme Court about this. Uh, so I won't say too many things. Others he will come and plant all I am saying in the Supreme Court. But be that as it may, now this problem, I think, to a great extent, will be, will be uh, obviated by the recovery of. Is there the recovery of oh, just give me a second? I, recovery of position, yeah, recovery of position of premises given on the on lease act. So the the it's going to be much more it's summary procedure, it's fast track. So this uh, should because I do understand that if you are an overstaying lessee, uh, whether you should be permitted to profit from your wrongful deed. That is why uh, Pfizer says that. And the courts have progressed to the wrongdoer principle. But I personally believe that is not what Silavati Malava says. It's it's the, the circuit. I'm not going to say too much of that on that. But, uh, having said I that, uh, having said that, uh, so most probably if uh, the Supreme Court grants leave in that matter, uh, this might be determined somewhere down the line. Uh, but the wrongdoer principle does, I, I think the, this quantification of damages, especially where there are liquidated damage clauses, uh, to be a bar for interim relief, uh, I think as, and I agree fully with Pfizer that the world has changed and we have moved on from that. There are so many new uh, new uh, instruments of interim relief that is there in, uh, and there are some old reliefs even in our civil procedure code which we are not using. And especially under the English uh, civil procedure rules, uh, it has been expanded and we don't have to stick by because liquidated damages, it's liquidated true enough, but the damage that may be caused until uh, the final relief is obtained, and especially in the context of the loss delays in Sri Lanka, that the courts should step in if the 
the if the damages even if there is uh, liquidated damages or whether the damages can be quantified the if the damage is irreparable and uh, irremediable then the court should join in but i personally don't think silavati malava allows what some plaintiffs are doing in court at the moment we we'll let the supreme court decide that Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, and I would like to uh, remind our dear viewers that uh, the upcoming half an hour is uh, open for your questions and answers. There is a uh, Q and A box on the Zoom panel. You may uh, access that and uh, uh, and uh, raise your questions. We have two questions already raised. Sir. I would like to uh, refer the first question to Mr. Faizal Mustafa. Sir, the, uh, an attendee is asking, under Section 666, what is the type of an application to be filed? Is it by way of motion or is it by way of petition and affidavit in a like manner under Section 6643? Best to be by petition and affidavit uh, because it says by application. You can't be by by way of motion because it specifically 6643. Even there, are courts don't entertain it by way of motion, where you can bring it to the notice of court. There's a pressure on its representation. But since he uses the word courts on his own motion, but they both get a very conservative approach that it should be made by application. So on a six 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 application, it's wider than six six four three, but it has to be made by way of petition and affidavit. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question would go to Mr. Jayasundar, uh, an attendee uh, uh, recently. Uh, uh, Call to the bar is asking us whether do we need to seek, seek an injunction along with a main action, for instance, like a revindication action, or could we only seek an injunction? Uh, so this is uh, again the uh, and the objections are also being taken uh, that you can't your main relief cannot be restricted to a permanent permanent injunction. That a permanent injunction is uh, Not a final relief as contemplated under the Judicature Act or the Civil Procedure Court. However, uh, a permanent injunction is uh, uh, is can be enforced as a decree in terms of Section two hundred sixteen because Section two hundred sixteen specifically uh, provides that uh, a final decree can relate to a permanent injunction. Of course. Uh, As in the case of your earlier question with regard to six six six, it is uh, if there is uh, such a problem, uh, the more prudent uh, the manner in which you approach the issue is that you seek a declaratory relief plus your interim uh, plus your injunctive relief. Of course, it doesn't make any sense because declaratory relief is unenforceable anyway. It's just a piece of paper. There are ways of enforcing a decree, but but it, it's not like a monetary judgment as a final relief. So uh, cautious uh, to approach it cautiously. I would advise that you ask for a declaratory relief as well as the injunctive relief because the approach of judges have also been that if you if you only ask for a permanent injunction, you will not be. Uh, you will not be uh, uh, will be not you will not be able to obtain interim relief on the basis that there is no permanent. Thank you, sir. And uh, the same viewer is asking us uh, what is the difference between regular and summary procedure for injunctions. I believe uh, that was the pre-amendment stage before 1988 yeah. uh, stage. So that is, I'm, I'm making that clarification. As of now, the law prevalent is. That uh, injunction is a regular procedure application. Uh, however, uh, as Mr. Musawar and Mr. Jayasundar, Karaga, uh, I, I just want, if I am not mistaken, uh, Pfizer pre nineteen eighty eight also the interim injunction was a regular application, but the vacation was summary, right? Vacation was summary. Vacation was summary. The application to vacation, vacation the interim or the uh, interim injunction was summary. Was summary. But uh, so the, this is pre. Uh, us coming into the program, but I believe it was uh, the injunction is sought in the regular procedure, but the vacate to vacate the, the interim injunction. Yeah, there was no, this in uh, 
uh, enjoyed yeah, the yeah. concept was introduced in 88 so yeah, yeah but to uh, vacate you needed to proceed with summary <laughs> procedure what the difference between summary procedure and uh, civil procedure sorry regular procedure i think you have to go back to law colleges try to tell some thoughts <laughs> uh thank you sir and uh, anyhow uh, that is the pre 1988 amendment position <laughs> and uh, as of now uh, for our viewers knowledge particularly a lot of young practitioners are with us today so it is regular procedure uh, as of now and uh, sir there are more questions coming in but i would like to ask you uh, mr jayasundar is our anton pillar orders part of our law and uh, could you explain how how it can be yeah used? so uh, so uh, anton pillar orders are uh, just for clarification anton pillar orders are it's like a or it's like a civil search warrant and it is granted it comes from this case called anton pillar uh, i think the 70s in uh, the uk Uh, high court uh, that gives where especially it is used in cases of uh, is uh, restraint of trade uh, confidential information intellectual property where the court because you know uh, you can go to somebody and ask for their documentation ask for their reports or uh, see whether there are any infringing products you can do that uh, Uh, you can do that in sri lanka uh, in a criminal action where you can get a search warrant so an anton pillar order is generally used in uh, intellectual property applications uh, which is a uh, order by which the court directs the uh, defendant to permit the plaintiff to enter the premises of the defendant and see whether You uh, uh, whether any infringing products or or what the evidence that the defendant sees now, uh, Anton Pillar orders are available in Sri Lanka, and especially I think just give me a second under the civil procedure. This is a uh, couple of sections that I don't know. It must have been used earlier, but it just being it just. Which is no not used much is section six six seven to six seventy of the Companies Act. Where uh, just give me one second to get the section. Uh, so section specifically section six six nine of the Civil Procedure Code says. that the court may on the application of any party to an action and on such terms as it thinks fit make an order for the detention preservation or inspection and survey of any property being the subject of such action for all or any of the purposes aforesaid authorize any person to enter upon or into any land or building in the possession of any party to such action and for all or any of the purposes uh, authorize any samples to be taken or any observation to be made uh, experiments to be tried and so on and so forth so that is in effect uh, and to uh, enter the premises and search and detain property or preserve property is an anton pillar order but uh, in uh, what what we don't have in sri lanka is the very very strict uh, rules that are provided in the english civil procedure code in respect of anton pillar order so Uh, there are three basic like uh, like our interim injunction uh, you need a, uh, more than a prima like you need a very very strong prima facie case uh, to obtain an anton pill order it has to be more uh, like uh, it has to be very very uh, a very strong prima facie case a very strong case of remediable and irreparable loss and those two uh, if you can satisfy those two and then the uh, the prejudice that may be caused to the defendant has to be very minimal so those three criteria that we use under felix das i know we have exactly but under felix das case the threshold becomes much higher in anton pill order and in england the 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 search and the inspection has to be taken uh, done 
in front of an independent uh, solicitor. So when you are making a making an application for an entrant bill or order, you also have to nominate a, a solicitor who is independent of the plaintiff or the plaintiff solicitors to uh, observe and be present at the time of inspection. Now, when that is done, th there are the rules with regard to how that independent solicitor should also act, and those are very very strict on how you have to do. There are so. A lot of cases where uh, the the search because of the defects in the search itself, the entire orders have been set aside. Uh, although it is it was very uh, frequently used in the 1980s in England, it has it's not very frequently used in England, but it is used in uh, mainly in South Africa. And I know a couple of instances where uh, entered bill orders have been opted. So basically for looking at accounts, uh, especially confidential information, whether, uh, whether confidential information is in the hands of the defendant, whether there is any exploitation of any such confidential information, those are the matters that are mostly used in respect of intellectual property cases. Thank you, sir. And we have a question, uh, Mr. Mustafa, on Mareva injunctions and its applicability and whether it can be granted under Section 662 of the Civil Procedure Code, uh, whether it's part of our law, sir. Yeah, Mareva injunction is where A he has to get money from B. B has to get some money from C, and you know that B is avoiding payment to you. So you get, you use Mareva injunction is part of a law, our law. And that, that is a very useful provision to be used with regard to injunctive relief because that's a very good mechanism of rec recovering monies from a person who is fraudulent to try to evade payment. So what you do is if you have information that somebody owes money to you has, has to be paid by another third party, you get a Mareva in injunction where you ask that money to be paid directly to you. So Mareva injunction, yes, is a part of a, a, a law. It was recognized up some time back. So that mechanism is a very useful mechanism uh, through injunctive relief to recover money's due to you. Uh, sir, is, is our freezing order, this is a question from me, uh, freezing orders, say freezing of assets, uh, can also be, uh, say, 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 as you said, uh, uh, a third party has say, say A owes money to B and A has some money deposited in the bank called C. Can you seek, uh, seek an order to freeze that money until this case uh, is determined? Done, is you, you, can, you can restrain the payment to be made and get that money directly be made to you. You can get an enjoining order of preventing them. Say, if you know that he has $200,000 in his bank account. And you owe hundred thousand. You can get an enjoining order up to hundred thousand, preventing him from utilizing that money. And then you can ask for a mandatory order that the money be paid to you. So, Tarek, can I just join? Yes. Uh, so, freezing, freezing orders uh, is what Mariva injunctions have developed into. Mariva injunctions uh, was it's from uh, the case. It, the name comes from a case. But it has developed further in England, and now it is called freezing orders. And statutory uh, recognition has been given where freezing orders are specifically provided. So uh, the original, uh, when Mariva injunctions were started, there was uh, there was a case called uh, after Mariva, there was a case called Siskina, uh, where the I think Lord Diplock, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, said that you must have a substantive, substantive cause of action within the jurisdiction. So uh, I remember a long time ago, uh, Mr. Kanageshwaran uh, did a case where there was a LC. Uh, so one company had a had a uh, not a judgment but had a claim against a Sri Lankan company. Uh, sorry, a uh, 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 English company had a claim against a Pakistani company and uh, that Pakistani company had supplied uh, something to Satosa, CWE, and there was money that was to be paid by CWE to the Pakistani company. 
so the the english company came to sri lanka and obtained a mariva injunction on the principle that you need only the asset of the third party within jurisdiction jurisdiction now that but it has been given a uh, statutory uh, recognition now and i think the 206 2016 or 17 civil procedure rules in england now you can get a freezing order even in uh, in the hands of a third party uh, and these are mainly now used for all this uh, corruption uh, corruption cases and also this uh, pyramid schemes uh, political corruption money uh, political corruption then uh, commercial frauds it's being used quite liberally in england and uh, especially i think quite recently there was a injunction that was obtained on uh, the bitcoin account of a particular person uh, it was a, 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 a financial fraud and the bitcoins were seized by an order of the english court so uh, it has developed much further we uh, although uh, in the commercial high court there have been several cases where the mariva injection has been applied uh, in fact as an example this the most controversial aeroflot case was a mariva injunction that was obtained uh, it the actual the law got lost because of all the other factors and other issues but the concept of restraining the removal of an asset of a person against whom you have a claim from jurisdiction is available but i think it was recognized on the in 1989 in mariva yeah. in sri lanka in that list of flavor i think uh, list of flavor versus okay. uh, inter in industrial engineers international yes just in era sector of dutch but also i think sorry if i I think cross-border recoveries have made use of Mariva injunctions a lot because yeah. otherwise they go to another jurisdiction. So you go to that jurisdiction and say this man owes me so much and and seizes his asset. So I think all over the world Mariva injunctions, like you said, Chandaka used to prevent fraud uh, to go, get at fraudsters who yeah. who bill for money and go to the jurisdiction. But and I, half the money also, and it's being used in England mainly because they use the wrongdoers use England. because of its financial status they use the money to park uh, they use london to park their money so uh, most of those cases are from like diverse countries like cyprus and italy and uh, places like that uh, but when the money is parked in a particular country for example uh, prime place might be dubai but i don't know whether you are entitled to get a money by in dubai Uh, but it's being used quite frequently internationally thank you sir and uh, now uh, we uh, sorry a... tarak if you can for the benefit of the participants the, that list of is very difficult to get the yes. reports yeah i i believe it's a unreported case it's uh, yeah. list of flavor and company uh, versus trading engineers international limited and national water supply and drainage board Uh, decided in 1992 justice jeratnas uh, judgment and in the last bar association law journal i think uh, i did a uh, quite a comprehensive paper on mariva injunction if anybody is interested thank you very much sir that is most helpful and we have a question uh, from a, uh, a new uh, new practitioner young practitioner sir i am i'm posing this to you uh, mr mustafa So I am also new to the bar. Can a, can an interim injunction be requested after a previously granted injunction order has been set aside due to false affidavit from one of the petitioners? Where can I find the relevant law? That means so the it, question it, is when when an injunction order has been set aside uh, on the basis that the uh, company verifying affidavit is false, can they still apply for the interim injunction? That seems so, to be the question. Yeah, when an enjoining order is refused, if post issues notice of interim injunction, then there will be an interim injunction inquiry. But if the enjoining order has been set aside on the basis of misrepresentation, it is very unlikely that you will get the interim injunction. And the interim injunction will also have to be dependent on that same affidavit, unless you unless what is contemplated is a new application for an interim injunction with a. non false affidavit i don't know whether that's what they are looking at 
but it will be very difficult after getting tainted by tendering a false affidavit the player court will be very very reluctant to because already you have breached the principles of obarima yeah. fides so that uh, court will not go into the merits at all because even if you have the even if you file another affidavit the, like you said chand like you you already tainted so that this is also right. yeah so this principle this principle of i think there is a lot of things involved in that question i think some understanding is uh, i i surmise that it might be whether res judicata will apply because there has not been a finding on merits but interim injunctions and stuff like that res judicata is a it's post judgment so with that this stage and if you have a false affidavit it's very very unlikely that you will get any relief subsequently and if you if you are enjoining order has been refused uh, not extended on suppression and misrepresentation of material facts there is no way you can get the interim injunction Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I'm going back to Mr. Jayasundar. Uh, sir, under Section 521, uh, is it possible? I, I believe it is possible to ask for an interim order during a pendency of a case. Uh, in such a situation where there is a new development that ought to be restrained, uh, in such a situation, it is more advisable to file a petition and affidavit under 521 in the same case, or to go for a fresh action. Uh, so that is a strategic decision because if you uh, uh, go in the same case, it's very unlikely that you will be able to get any ex parte relief. So you will have to give notice to the other side. Uh, so then, any advantage you need, you seek from obtaining ex parte relief is lost. Uh, so it's a strategic thing. So if you want an ex parte decree, uh, sorry, ex parte interim order, then what is done? Generally, is that you file a fresh action, uh, or you file the same thing and get it ex parte. Also, that that is possible, and that has been done. Uh, it depends on the circumstances because if it is germane to the same facts before court, and the, it's a party to the application who is seeking that interim relief, then you are entitled to that. In fact, that case I was speaking about, which is day to day. is on this issue whether one of the issues is whether multiplicity of actions is uh, can be permitted or whether uh, all the problems should be resolved in the same action without going having in that case i think there are about in the commercial high court i think there are about three cases there uh, and there are orders for get orders suspended new orders and all that so that is a strategic decision that you need to take but you might face the problem of the respondents or the other side objecting or to file but strategically if you want an ex parte you can do either right very right. unlikely that in the can, I just, can i just can i just yeah. interrupt in of course sir chandra can remember that other case we did the oppression mismanagement case we we the, the substand it all is based on the substantive relief of the petition if you can if you can Connected to that, then you can file a five to one application and get an interim order. Unlike in a district, uh, unlike in terms of normal injunctions, where only if you have a if you have substantive relief, you can ask for interim relief. Here, any party can get interim relief if they can correlate it to the substantive relief which the petitioner is seeking. So, in, in that case, I think there were about from both sides the same case. There were I think about four, five. Application for interim relief. Some were given ex parte, some were inter partes. Uh, so ultimately, the judge got sick of us so much, and there were several parties. He said, "I will give one nod and finish the whole thing." Thank you, sir. Uh, one last question to wrap up. I believe we are coming to the tail end of a very very interesting session, uh, and we are getting some good. Uh, apart from questions, we are getting some good feedback. Also, thanking. Uh, to a minute council uh, so this is uh, i think both of you can answer this question when uh, an enjoining order is not granted but only notices of interim injunction is issued and the defendant uh, continues to uh, continues to carry out with the act that is sought to be restrained by the interim injunction the question is whether you have to file a separate motion bring that to the notice of court or whether you can address the same in the written submissions because there is no positive order preventing that act but 
as it might the the uh, the question is whether it might help the plaintiff's case if you bring that fact to the notice of court by way of a motion or whether you can address it in the written submissions at the interim action inquiry. I think you will. Uh, yes, I. No, no, you go ahead. If you can adduce new material when the plaintiff was when the plaintiff was obtained and circumstances have changed, right? Then you can you can get another enjoining order by way of petition. But once the enjoining order is refused, you can't get another enjoining order on the same relief. So you have to wait until the interim injunction inquiry is concluded. Yes. Or, or appeal from the uh, refusal of the enjoining order and get a restraining order. So yeah, good, 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 good question. I, 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 if I mean, we have seen when particularly from the commercial high court when we apply appeal. Uh, on an enjoining order, sometimes we are asked to conclude the interim injunction and uh, come to the Supreme Court. Uh, I have practical experience that is it is it not possible to appeal on the refusal of an enjoining order? Is that what it is? I think it is possible. It's just that the courts don't want to waste time. They say, why are we going through the enjoining order? You go and finish expeditiously finish the interim injunction inquiry and then come on the substantive issue. I think generally what counsel, what as counsel we do, we go to the court, Supreme Court and we try to get a directive to get the interim injunction inquiry concluded in a very limited period of time. And that itself is an achievement because we have seen certain interim injunction inquiries taking more than six months to a year. Thank you very much. Sir. I believe we are uh, at the closing point. Uh, let me thank Mr. Faisal Mustafa, President's Council, and Mr. Chandaka Jayasundar, President's Council, both uh, whom I have had the privilege of working with uh, for a very interesting session and a very uh, informative uh, contribution. And also, I would like to thank the sessions committee, uh, the sessions committee, seminar committee of the Bar Association. Uh, particularly its chairman, Mr. Isuru Balapatapadi, who is also the secretary of the Bar Association, and Mr. Kaushal Naratna, the president of the BASL, and all the members, the deputy chairman, Pandula, uh, the conveners, Nikini, Sampat, and Deshini, and the co-conveners, for facilitating this. And uh, hope to see all of you, uh, our dear viewers. Thank you for your kind patronage. And hope to see all of you at the next session of uh, the webinar series 2023. With that, uh, we wrap up the session. Thank you very much, Mr. Mustafa. Thank you very much, Mr. Gaisundra. Thank, Thank you, Tarek. Thank you very much.